Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are in Matthew chapter 24. We have dealt with earthquakes and famines and pestilences and tribulation. Now we're getting to uh, what I think is probably the most important day that this earth has ever seen aside from the day of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Now we're getting into some serious stuff here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 is where we'll start. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. Now, I could stop reading right there because that's as far as we're going to get today. Okay? The dark sun. What we're going to do is I'm going to read the rest of this. We're going to go to Mark's version of it and then Luke's version of it. And what I thought I would do on this first part is go through all the places like Isaiah 13 and Revelation, but I won't do that. Once I got to that sun shall be darkened part, I started thinking about that. What all it meant. Why, why, why is God darkening the sun of all things. Why is he doing that? Okay. We'll peer into scripture and see if we can find an answer to that. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Trust me, they're going to when they see this. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now let's go to Mark's version of that. Remember the Gospels, the first three are synoptic, meaning they look similar to each other. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it follows like our DNA uh, guanine, cytosine, adenine, you'll find it in RNA, the single strand. You'll find uracil in RNA, but for some reason, there's a transformation that takes place in the fourth one. Because adenine, guanine, cytosine stay the same, uracil changes to thymine. Thymine's different than the other three. John's different than the other three. So John doesn't even have this in it anywhere. John mentions nothing about this particular teaching that, that we're doing about the days of those tribulation and this, he doesn't say a word about it, okay? So let's see what Mark says. Mark 13, verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, it's a very specific one, the sun shall be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall. The powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now Luke's version. Luke 21 verse 25. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. I want you to think about the effect. We'll talk a little bit about that. The effect of what would happen scientifically, physically, in the world that we live in, when the sun goes completely dark and the moon does not give her light or turns to blood. Would there be a physical, meaning physics, effect in this world? Would it affect the sea in any way? The sea's going to roar on that day. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for redemption draweth 
nigh. Somebody say amen. Now, I've had conversations with people about what I believe. I, this looks like a rapture to me. It looks like our resurrection. And I want you to notice, because I'm going to make an illustration here in a little bit, that he says, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads. And there's a reason why I'm saying that today, and you'll see it in about 45 to 50 minutes, all right? So hey, just hang with me, okay? Um, and we talked about this. What would be the effects? And, I, and just a guess here, the effects of the sun being darkened. Would it have an effect, number one, on weather patterns? You bet. You see, the sun's always shining on the earth. Even at night, here, it's shining somewhere. On this particular day, and the sun has everything to do with weather patterns on this, on this earth. Everything to do. Um, the amount of moisture that comes up out of the ocean the, and that moisture moving mass quantities of air and moisture throughout the world. Okay. So you've got the sun bringing moisture up from the seas, this, this, that moisture turning into clouds, clouds moving about with the different air currents around the world. And all of a sudden now there's no sun to shine on the earth. Weather patterns freaking out more than likely uh, because the sun is being darkened. The heat from the sun that gives this earth warmth temporarily cut off. What? But talk about climate change. I mean, who's actually changing the climate here? Is it our cars? Is it our motorcycles? Is it our lawnmowers? Is it cow flatulence? No, it's God doing it. So just, just the physical part, when, when people, Luke was right, people are going to lose their minds on this day. They're going to, they're going to blow it. They're just going to, if not kill over and die, want to. Because when this happens, it's going to be an, a noticeable, instantaneous event that cannot, you see, they can cover up, you know, they covered up atomic bomb tests at the Trinity site and nobody, nobody knew about them. The first atomic bomb that exploded, nobody in the world knew about it. They can cover that up. They can cover UFOs up. They can cover Bigfoot up. They can cover aliens at Roswell. They can cover, they won't be able to deny this one. This one's going to happen. And it's going to happen big. God, when Jesus appears in that cloud, everybody's going to know it. That's what I believe. Everybody's going to know it. Now, um, let's talk about the sun for a minute. Let's talk about the symbolism. We asked the question, why is God darkening the sun? And that again, that's as far as we're going to get today. Remember what I said earlier. Where, by the way, where's the sun? Okay, and think about the symbolism of the sun when he says, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Think of the symbolism of the sun it represents, let, let's say it represents good because that's what God said, it represents light, it represents um, Jesus, light represents the gospel, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Remember that? So it represents all these things, but it represents Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first place that light shows up in the universe. And it's not the day the sun was created. It's the day that God spoke his word. And who is his word? Jesus Christ. And where do we find that? In John's gospel, which is the fourth gospel, fourth book of the, of the New Testament. And I'm holding these four fingers up. You know why, if you've watched me before. 
There's a reason why. Genesis chapter 1, notice what God said. And God said, one, two, three, four, four words. Let there be light. You see the connection between God's word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And when you hide God's words in your heart that you might not sin against God, what then do you have in your heart? You have light. You have the light. God is, God is giving light to the universe here. And there's no sun, moon, stars. There's no other source for this light other than the word of God. I can't in my life make that clear enough to people that instead of watching this and reading this and following this guy or listening to this woman or whatever you do, you could be reading this and gaining a whole lot more light in your heart and in your daily life than you do from anywhere else. Just consider that whatever you could read on the internet or read from any book or anything like that would, would be a candle against the sun, if it's a candle at all. Because I have, I'm, I'm telling you, God's brought me back to this book, man, and I love it. Most of the internet is darkness. Most of what you see here in this world is absolute, utterly corrupt darkness. And see, God separates it. Notice what he said. Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And bef again, before God does anything else, he creates the heaven and the earth and light. Let there be light. And when you, when you make yourself or when God makes you hungry enough to where you do it just because you're starving, when you get into this book, you'll never want to climb out. I promise you. It is the well that once you drink of it, you're never thirsty again. You'll never go to a different well. You'll never go anywhere else. You'll never change religions. You're gonna stay right here with this, with this one Bible right here, okay? I love it. So then God speaks these four words, let there be light. Then on day four of creation, he, does, he finally gives a source for that light for the earth. And God made two great lights. This is Genesis 1.16. The greater light to rule the day, what light would that be? That would be the sun. And the lesser light, what light would that be? The moon, to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And watch this, to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. One, two, three, four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four represents the spiritual world. So when he created the stars, I believe he created all of the angelic realm on that day, because stars and angels, according to the Bible, pretty much the same thing. Even the star of Jacob is the son, that's Jesus Christ. I'm not saying Christ was created, don't misquote me, okay? But you get what I'm saying here. We're dealing with the spiritual realm here. And notice that the sun, the greater light, rules over the day. Now, according to 1 Thessalonians, let's go there. Whose children of the day? Who are the people of the day? And then when the sun is dark, who rules over them? The dark sun. So I've used that phrase a couple times now, and I want you to think then who that would represent. If 
the lighted sun represents Christ. Maybe I'll use the right hand for Christ because that's where the sheep are. If the lighted sun is Christ, the dark sun, you get it now, don't you? Unless you're going, what? 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 Jimmy Hoffa? No, the Antichrist. Anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Now remember, day, light, good. Darkness, night, bad. The dark sun, the lighted sun rules over the children of the day, which is God's people who have his word. When he said, I am the light of the world, and then he said, ye are the light of the world, it's only we're the light of the world because we have this shining out of our lives. And I promise you, people, you won't have to get in people's face with it. They'll see, when people are in darkness, they can recognize the light in your life. They may not like it, but they can recognize it. So the, the lighted sun ruling over the children of the day, the dark sun ruling over the children of darkness. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, which means don't go to Rodney Howard Brown's preaching thing and let him make you drunk in the spirit. Don't do that. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. There he says it again putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So to be children of the day simply means to be children of God, a child of God, a son of God, and all of us who are born again are children of our Father. And because we're children of the day, that means we live in a very happy tabernacle. Let me explain that here in a little bit. We're called a lot of things in the Bible. We're called a lot of things in this world too, but we're called a lot of things in the Bible. We're called children of the day. We're called the saints. We're called the elect. We're also called the bride. What does the bride await? The bride awaits the bridegroom. And is there anything in the Bible that links the bridegroom with the son? Yes. One of my favorite places in the Bible, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. I love this. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, and he's talking about the firmament, the heavens, and how the sun rises every day and goes down every day. How it ri We've talked about this, how it rises from the south to the north to the south again every year. It shows us Christ coming, his first coming, shows us his death, burial, and coming again, his resurrection, and his coming again. And then he says, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the son, which is as a bridegroom. So Christ here is reckoned as the son. So he is, let there be light. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That matches. Now we have Christ, the Bridegroom, the light of the world, as a Son in the tabernacle of the heavens. The heavens are a tabernacle. The Son going from east to west, the high priest coming into the tabernacle from the east, going to the west where the most holy place was, to offer the blood for the atonement of sins. 
I love it. When did, when did Christ die? And in relative, relativity to the time of day, when did Christ die? Was it in the morning? Was it at noon? No, it was toward the evening. In fact, they had to get him off the cross before dark took place. The sun going down in the west shows us the death of Christ. I love this stuff. I could talk about this all day. Is that the only place in the Bible that refers to God or the Lord or Christ as the Son? No. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Oh, I love this. For the Lord God is a sun. Now again, stop and think about this for a minute. What's going to happen when the sun is taken away? When the sun is darkened? Now look at this next thing that he said here. The Lord God is a sun and shield. What's going to happen on the day that God removes the shield away? What is it? Remember what a shield represents? The shield of faith? Think about God's protection over this world. Think about all the things that God is not letting out. All the things that God all the evil devils that are up in the heavens that God won't let come down here to this earth. There's a third of them, and that's a lot. Think of all the things that God is keeping down in a pit, that he is protecting this world from. And I submit to you that in the day that the sun no longer shines, God is not only removing the light from this world, he's removing the shield. He is removing what protects this earth and the people on this earth. See, it's not up to um, Greenpeace and Al Gore and all of the all the funny money that goes into climate change companies and all, it's not up to them to save the planet. It's not up to Captain Planet. God is the one doing that. It's not up to the Avengers either to say, or Superman to save the planet. It's up to God. Right now, he's a shield to this world. He is keeping things out of this world that don't belong here, but he's not going to do that forever. He's going to unleash his fury on this world, like he did in the days of Noah. God was shielding this earth from being flooded. God was shielding this earth from never being rained on. And then all of a sudden he removed the shield. And what, remember what I said, if God darkened the sun and the moon, and let's say when God darkens the moon, the effects of the moon's gravity also, okay? Because that, that does things. Do you think there's going to be earthquakes? Oh, I do. Earthquakes and storms. And again, it's going to get everybody's attention. But I think God is going to remove the shield on that day. Malachi chapter 4, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise, that's the sun coming up in the east, with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves, of the stall. Now think about this. Right now, Christ is our righteousness. And anybody, anybody who wants righteousness in their life can come to Christ and get it. I have. Boy, did I want it. Because I tried for years living in my own righteousness. And that was a joke. I found out that was a big joke. Okay, you can't do it. So all the people that can come now to Christ and will come to Christ and his righteousness. But let's say now, because the sun is darkened, God takes his righteousness away from this earth. Remember, right now he's a shield, shielding this earth, 
shielding the people of this earth. I think he's going to take that away. He's going to take the righteousness away. So what do we have left? We have the son of righteousness. Then we have the man of sin. The son of perdition. Literally, the son of hell. Okay? The son of hell. Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John, his brother. Wow, you have four people. Jesus, Peter, James, John. One of them is different than the rest of the three. You get that? And bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And if you think, well, I'd love to see that. It freaked Peter out. Peter's like, uh, uh, tab tabernacle. we'll build tabernacles. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Peter was like out of his mind when seeing Jesus and now his face shining as the sun. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. When, when John, John saw this same Jesus and guess what? His face was still shining as the sun. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. I love this picture of Jesus Christ, because not only does it link Christ with the sun and the light and the gospel, but links him with what I have right here. That is the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any of our enemies' weapons that they have against us. Now, I want you to remember that part of it. Uh, I preached last Sunday about the word of God being the sword, okay? The sword is the weapon that you use when you're tired of your enemies beating up on you, okay? You use the sword and say, I'm done with you, and you finish off your enemies so they can't hurt you anymore, okay? The Lord and his weapons are important. Now think of the weapon, think of and I'm going to put this verse on the screen in a little bit, but think of the weapons of our warfare, because that's where I'm going with this. I'm going to get into history a little bit, sort of modern history. I'm not going back past 100 years, but I'm going to get into history a little bit to show you, because the thing that has been still is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. Revelation 10, I believe this mighty angel is Christ. I could be wrong, but notice the description. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun. So far, everything we've seen of Jesus, Matthew 17, uh, Revelation chapter 1, the, the typology of Moses coming down from the mountain, his face shining like the sun so bright the people are going, Moses, put a veil over that. And now you have an angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow over his head. That's the glory of the Lord in, in Ezekiel chapter 1, his face shining as the sun, and he has an open book in his hand. What did Christ just do in Revelation 5? He took the book, and in Revelation 6, he's opening the seals. So now the book's open. This is either Christ or it's his like number one messenger and he gives him the book and says, go do this or whatever. I think it's Christ. But anyway, his face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire and his, had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea 
his left foot on the earth. That shows dominion. The ten toes. The number ten represents dominion and the law. And when you put, you put your foot on the sea and you put your foot on the land, you're saying, this is mine. Okay? And you can't have it. It's all mine now. Okay? Now, when, and think about what we've seen so far with Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't like he opened his hands and sunlight came out of his hands, you know, like you see in like some superhero movies. It was his face. His face was shining as the sun. Matthew 17, uh, Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 10. It's his face shining as the sun. Now imagine, just, and maybe some of you have been through this. Imagine for a little bit if God were to hide his face from you. See, his face shining as the sun is showing you the way for you to go in your life. And boy, have we taken some wrong turns. And God has been so faithful to us to shine the light on us, to show us the way to go, to show us the sin, to show us the evil nature in our hearts, to remove all the darkness and the sin out of our lives. But what if God hid his face from us? I would not want that. I cannot begin to tell you how bad I would not want that. You see, because of what I believe, I know that my soul is going to depart this earth and spend eternity in one of two places one of which I don't even want to think about going to. The other one, I hope in Christ to go to. So what would it be like? And what would you have to do for God to hide his face from you? Deuteronomy 31. Verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. He's talking to Moses. And this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land. Stop right here. Remember what we said strangers is related to in the Bible. The word alien. They are one and the same. They mean the same thing. They are not from here. Notice, notice the length. I love this King James. You'll never get me to depart from this book ever. He said, this people will rise up and go whoring. That, you know what that means. That is he literally, yeah. I think he literally means it. After the gods, the strangers, the land. Boom. When God sees that happen, you can bet he's going to hide his face. Look at what it says. Whither they go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them. And they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us? Because our God is not among us, look at this. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought in that they are turned unto other gods. See, they're going to recognize, they're going to know it. They're going to say, our God is not among us. Why? Because they went whoring. And there is always, you listen to me, the four things that the apostles and the elders in Acts 15 told us as Gentiles. Don't eat things strangled. Don't eat meats offered to idols. Don't drink or eat blood. No fornication. Out of four things, what does one have to do with the other? Three of them have to do with what you eat. Fourth one is, well, you get it. 
no fornication because God knows God knows that the more adulterous literally adulterous that the people become you see who is it Mick Jagger can't get no satisfaction so that drives a man or a woman to just crave more and more and more I heard a wrestler give an interview and he said I tried to be happily married when he started his wrestling career but he's on the road and got all these women and he said then it starts out with one then two and then you got a half a dozen and then all of a sudden you don't love your wife anymore and you're constantly wanting more and is not that it, the exact thing that is happening in this adulterous, fornicating world right now. People are not satisfied with marriage. Then they're not satisfied with having one mistress or mister. Then they're not satisfied with adults. Then they're not satisfied with people of the opposite gender. And they're going to be craving for these gods. That's how it's going to happen. See, Sodom went after strange flesh, didn't they? And what was the strange flesh they were, they were looking at? The two angels. This Bible's right. Deuteronomy 32, verse 20, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward, which means to word means I'm going toward heaven. Froward means I'm going from heaven. I'm going away from heaven. You can be toward or froward. And this generation is a very froward generation. Children in whom is no faith. Remember the shield of faith? And God is that shield. And what would happen if he removed that shield? Psalm 102, verse 2. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. This is us begging God to not hide his face. Because now we know the consequences. Now we know, now we get it. If God hides his face from us, we're done. Psalm 143, 7, Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be... Here, listen to this one now. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Who's in the pit right now? some angels that God sentenced to be jailed down there. And one of these days, he's going to let them out for a brief period. As you're thinking about that, I want you to take a look at this symbol on the screen. It looks a little weird, doesn't it? it does, does it not remind you of a swastika it does and it does for a reason and this is the history part that we're going to get into so let's go back a little bit to a verse that god spoke to jeremiah listen to what he said jeremiah chapter 1 verse 13 the word of the lord came again unto me the second time saying what seest thou and i said i see a seething pot and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Now, take a look at that image again. Let me tell you what that is. It's called, get ready for this one, the dark sun. Yeah, I've been, I've been setting you up this whole time. All these scriptures about 
the Son and Christ and righteousness and faith and hide, God hiding his face from us, that's all been for a reason. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And there is no new thing under the sun, including this and what it means. I have in my repertoire, my library of books that I've collected over the years, a lot of people send me things, uh, books and so on, and I'll scan them and I'll PDF them and I'll store them in a place. That way I can search. I can, I can use the tools that I have to search an entire book for a word or a phrase. I can search a thousand books. And I happened upon this one in my library. It's called Reich of the Black Sun, Nazi Secret Weapons, the Cold War Allied Legend. Now, what do you think this book's going to talk about? Adolf Hitler, National Socialism, where they got, where Hitler and Himmler got their ideas from, and what they were up to, and what was, um, not Project Blue Book, Operation Paperclip. What was that? You know what it is? You can look it up. It's real easy. Office of Special Services, which then became the CIA. There was a race to Berlin. And there was a race to capture all of the German scientists that we could. The Russians were after the same thing. Those German scientists and their papers and their work. And those scientists were so important that, I'm trying to remember this right, but there was a situation where one of Hitler's weapons things, tests went bad and they knew the Allies were on their way to come after whatever test that was. And all of a sudden now, the uh, SS decided to kill all of the scientists working on it and burn all the papers. Why? They did not want the Allies finding out what they were doing. They didn't want them getting the information. This is about black operations. And remember, the weapons of warfare. Uh, in this book, I found out, and you can find this also on Wikipedia as well. There's a castle called Castle Wewelsburg, Wewelsburg, something like that. Castle Wewelsburg. I, I just want to call it Castle Wolfenstein because that was, that was the first game I played on PC. Castle Wolfenstein. Okay, And it had a lot to the storyline of Castle Wolfenstein had a lot to do with what we're going to talk about today. It was Heinrich Himmler and all the occult stuff that he was doing at this particular castle. Castle Wewelsburg, this is from page 171 of Reich of the Black Sun. There, and notice the shape of this castle. One, two, three. Triangular. Now that number represents, you could think of it as... The beast, the false prophet, the dragon, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, the man of sin, son of perdition. Okay, think of it as that way. This this castle was chosen for a particular reason by Heinrich Himmler. There Himmler had constructed a central chamber with a large table designed to seat 12 men specially selected from the senior Gruppenführers. That means generals. I don't know why I just didn't say generals but that German group and first. Anyway, of the SS, a 12,000 volume library of the occult was available in the castle. Now in this castle, on the North Tower, Himmler knew what he was doing. On the North, remember that seething pot with its face toward the North and God said an evil is gonna come from the north. And I've talked about that many times. What does that mean? It's going to come from the spiritual realm. That's what, out of the four directions, the north seems to be that portal to the spiritual realm. Where does God come from? Ezekiel 1. The north 
all through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you see it everywhere. They're coming from the north. They're coming from the north, out of the north country. And there is no country up there in the north. So what is it talking about? It's talking about the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm. So in the north tower, Heinrich Himmler built this room to have rituals in. It's the room where he put the table with the, so that, and it had 12 seats in it. Think of, think of that number, okay? In the Bible, what does it mean? The number 12, in Genesis 12, we have the, uh, the promise of God. The fulfillment of that promise is in New Jerusalem. Remember I said that, New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem has 12 gates, 12 foundation stones, New Jerusalem has uh, the names of the 12 tribes, the names of the 12 apostles. Uh, it's got the 144,000 in it. It's got all these 12s all over it. The tribes of Israel. You have Christ here in the tabernacle, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire by night. You have Christ there in the tabernacle, surrounded by the 12 tribes. Do you understand that? Okay. And those 12 tribes represent the, the months of the year, because every month, if you look up at night straight up, there's a different set of stars directly overhead. God is, the one, now this is not Satanism. God made this. God designed the, the plan of the wilderness camp to show them that they're going to be, just like he told Abraham, as the stars of heaven. So he puts the tabernacle of the sun, right? In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, and the 12 tribes surrounding that, Christ being in the midst of his people always, and it shows the heavens. So the number 12 will always, astrology, the religion of astrology has what? If I had 12 fingers, I would stick up 12 fingers. It has the 12 constellations in it, and they pray and worship those 12 constellations, because they say those 12 constellations guide and rule our life. That's a lie. The creator of those constellations guide and rule our life, not the stars themselves. Okay. So I'm explaining this table, why he had only 12 there. And he set this table. I want you to take a look at this. He set the table in this room right above Notice that he put it on the floor, the symbol of the dark sun. He put it on the floor. Why, why the floor? And I, I don't know this for sure, but I can imagine that the table was probably round and probably had this design on it. I could be wrong, could be way off, could be guessing, but we know for a fact because this is a a recent picture, it's still there. The castle's still there. They use it as a, like a youth hostel today. They, they want to remove it so far away from Hitler and all that stuff, but it's, it's their history. They're going to have to deal with it. That dark sun symbol is still there. And Himmler used to have rituals in this room in the tower, in the north tower of this particular castle with these 12 men sitting around this table the symbol of the black sun. Now, think about this. If you go into, like if you go into St. Peter's Basilica, if you look up, there's images of God and Jesus and all the saints and clouds and everything. In other words, they put all of their stuff up. If you go into the Capitol building, Washington, D.C., you look up, you see what's called the apotheosis of Washington, which means... Washington now is our God that looks down over us, okay? And he's surrounded by these 13 goddesses. That's way occult. But anyway, the idea is that he's up there, okay? So why would the black sun be on the floor? It's because the dark sun, the black sun, is not up there. It's down there in the pit. Remember, Lord, hide not thy face from us, lest we be like those that go down into the pit. Himmler, here's what Himmler and his Gruppenführers were doing here. 
They were reading these occult books. They were doing these occult rituals as part of the Thule Society. Let me pull that symbol up for you. Thule Gesellschaft, which means Thule Society. What is the Thule Society? It's the idea of what's called Ultima Thule. Thule means the North Country. Ultima Thule means the North Country. We named something we found out in the farthest reaches of our solar system, Ultima Thule. They found it a year or two ago, and they named it that. They said it's the farthest thing we can find in our own solar system. They named that after a secret land that they believed that was up at the North Pole, where, you know, a guy lives, and he has all these elves, and he makes... To anyway. Now, according to this book, Reich of the Black Sun. Here's what Himmler was doing there. Page 172. Central to the secret initiation that these senior SS generals received was the real significance of the anagram SS itself. From the rank and file elite of the SS, the initial stood for the German word Schutzstaffel, a term meaning loosely a special staff or military unit. But to the initiates, the 12 Gruppenführer. There was another meaning of SS altogether, a meaning with roots deep in the occult and an ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, and to a certain extent, Egyptian belief. For these initiates, the letters SS referred to Daishwatsi Son, or the Black Sun. The doctrine of the Black Sun, reaching back to ancient Sumer, which is Shinar in the Bible, in Akkadia, is that there are two suns. Stop right here. What have I been setting you up for? Children of the day, children of darkness. If we have the sun of God shining in our hearts, we're children of the day. But there are people in this world who are fixing to have a transformation. Everybody's going to go through a ritual, and it doesn't include a needle, people. Everybody's going to go through an initiation. And they're going to receive the dark sun in their hearts. Born again of corruptible seed. That's what's coming. The doctrine of the black sun reaching back to ancient Sumer and Akkadia is that there are two suns. The white sun, the sun that we see at the center of our physical solar system, and the black sun, a hidden sun of spiritual illumination. In Babylonian mythology, it was also associated with the coming of, get this, the king of kings. Stop right here. You think it's referring to Jesus Christ, don't you? It's not. This Bible is so right. It is so right. Daniel chapter 2. This is the dream, verse 36, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom represented the head of gold. And after him was the chest of silver, thighs of brass, the feet and the toes of iron, part iron, part clay. Remember what the iron and clay is. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And in order to destroy the king of kings, you don't aim for the head. You aim for the toe, the weakest part. You aim for the feet, the toes. And it's going to destroy the whole thing. See, God has been setting up this fourth kingdom for thousands of years. The devil has too. He's just been letting the devil play along. But God has been setting this up since the creation. It's all the plan of God. A false king of kings. Babylon mythology, it was associated with the coming of the king of kings and the establishment of a new Babylon with the uttermost Hyperborea and Thule, the legendary stellar, this guy knows it, he got it right the legendary stellar home and celestial origin of the Aryan race. The doctrine received further modification in ancient Egypt. He gets it. 
He understands that the Aryan race was never about anything like, you know, the proto-Indians or the proto-Europeans, nothing like that. It wasn't about blonde-haired, blue-eyed babies. It wasn't about that. It was about the source of the Aryan kingdom. It didn't come from here. It had a stellar home. Stellar means from the stars. They, see, in order to have this new Babylon, this thousand-year Reich, and this Aryan race, well, Hitler certainly didn't qualify. Neither did Himmler. Neither did the top five people in the Nazi party. None of those guys were blonde-haired, blue-eyed. I think they understood that they were going to call the gods down to create this Aryan race. And in order to do that, they needed power. They needed weapons. They needed weapons that the other guys didn't have. And Hitler's regime was better at it than anybody else's in the entire world. More and better weapons were created by the German war machine in World War II than was ever created by all of history put together. I mean, you have the invention of the jet airplane, the atomic bomb, you have the, the bell, Go find out what that is. Der Glock, okay? Der Glock, and it's not a gun. Go find out what that was. Himmler and his Gruppenführers were doing, they were contacting along with uh, Maria Orsic and a group called the Vril Society. They were contacting spirits and tapping into an energy source that they referred to as the black or the dark sun. And it all came from a science fiction book. Remember that 12,000 volume library of occult books that Himmler had? This one was one of them, Vril, The Coming Race, written by, of all people, a British guy. And this guy, late 1800s, wrote of a group of people that lived beneath the, that the earth is hollow. You can look up hollow earth and get all kinds and go into all kinds of weird stuff. Now, do I believe in a hollow earth? Nah. Do I believe that there's a pit down there where God's got some angels tied up? Yeah. That's what I believe. Okay. That's what the Bible says. So Himmler and his Vril Society and all these guys were trying to tap in to these spirits to learn how to build weapons that nobody had even thought of before. There's some indication that says that underneath this, or another castle somewhere, that there was actually a Nazi captured UFO that had crashed somewhere in Germany. And they secreted it away and Hitler said, Himmler, somebody said, figure out how this thing does this. And they were well on their way to doing it. Now you know why I've said this, talked about our weapons of warfare. Because the weapons of warfare that are being worked on right now in this world are not carnal weapons. Neither then should the weapons that we have be carnal either. I have weapons in my house, truders, things like that. But the things I'm really scared of are not intruders in the night, because so far I've never had one. The things I'm really scared of, they don't tend to have faces that I can see, bodies that I can feel. Okay? Principalities, powers, rulers the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, by the way, that logo, you see it there in the 
uh, tool societies, you see what looks like a, a swastika. That's why Hitler used it. Because, get this, and this I found in this book about, you know, Hitler's weapons program. The celestial swastika. The North Star is a star up in the North Pole. doesn't move, okay? And it's used for navigation. It's been used for navigation for thousands of years. Around the North Star is a constellation called Draco, the dragon. The dragon lives up at the north. Get it? Okay. Oh, I like this. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. In the tabernacle, where was the table of shewbread? North, south, east, or west? It was on the north side of the tabernacle, facing Draco. Thou preparest a table before him. And it had how many loaves of bread on it? Twelve. In the presence of mine enemies. And then, right there in the midst of Draco the dragon, is the constellation Ursa Minor. Do you know what Ursa means? It's the same as Arcturus, Hyperborea, Thule. It's a reference to the bear, and the bear is a reference to the north. And notice what happens, and this guy put it together, when you have, it, it's, it's also called the Little Dipper. Ursa Minor is the Little Dipper, and when you put four of the Little Dippers together surrounding the North Pole, drop my hat, what do you have? It's called the Celestial Swastika. And Hitler didn't invent the swastika. The swastika goes back thousands and thousands of years. And it's a symbol, get this, that represents auspiciousness, which is simply a word for one of these days we'll become gods. How's that? That's what it means. Now, the official symbol of the Thule Society that was adopted was a variation of the black sun. Let me go back to the first black sun. Remember, it has 12 black rays coming out of it surrounding the center, which is 13. What does 13 represent in the Bible? Well, Deuteronomy 13, the false prophets. Acts 13, a false prophet. Revelation 13, a false prophet. Revelation 13, the dragon. Revelation 13, the beast. Revelation 17, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations to the earth. Thus, the, the 12 surrounding the 13th. But the actual Thule Society used a different version of the Black Sun or the Dark Sun logo. It has two X chromosomes in it, right? The Dark Sun in the middle, 16 black rays, 16 white rays, 32 total, centered around the Black Sun, which makes it 33. Now, remember, Himmler's program was all about building weapons. By the grace of God, they lost the way. Hitler was close to having an atomic bomb. Had Hitler had an atomic bomb, we'd all be wearing swastikas. Had that happened, God allowed it to go to a certain point and no further. So... Now, America, we're supposed to be the good guys, right? So the Americans march in, grab all of Hitler's scientists, find out what they're up to, including this idea of this energy called the dark sun and the occult powers that were behind it. And so now, take a look at this building. Pentagon. Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet sounds, and what happens? Stuff starts flying out of the pit. And the Pentagon right now, releasing video after video after video. I'm stunned nowadays. Now that I quit watching the news, 
and quit going to like the Drudge Report and all these news sites every day. Sometimes I don't know what all's going on in the world, but I'm amazed now at the number of stories that are popping up mainstream news agencies reporting on UFOs. They never used to do that. And this all started with the New York Times releasing this story about the Pentagon running a program called ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And you remember, they released three videos, the Tic Tac, the Go Fast, and the Gimbal. And these were UFOs that were seen and videoed and captured on video by our top gun pilots. They were not reflections of the sun in the cabin of the jet that they were flying in. That's what some scientists came up with. They were not uh, faults in billion dollar technology. They were not ghosts in the machine of radars. Get this, radars that were developed specifically to capture UFOs on radar. Because UFOs can jump in and out of radar and you'd never know they were there. So all of a sudden now we have advancements in radar that can capture these things. That's how they sent, I can't remember what his name was. He's a Top Gun pilot. They sent him out to go find out what it was that had dropped from 80,000 feet down to the surface of the ocean in a matter of two seconds. They sent him to go find out what it was and they wanted to know if he had any armaments on his jet. He said, are you kidding me? They thought, he thought maybe they'd had, uh, you know, like uh, they were smuggling drugs or something like that in a boat. They were going after pirates or something like that. They asked him, what do you got for ordnance? I'm not carrying nothing, this is a test. We're out here, you know, playing war here. And they sit him down to go look at it, and he's going, I'm seeing this big giant tic-tac doing things that I've never seen anything do before. And he said, boy, do I, David Fravor is his name. He says, boy, do I want to go fly one of these things. Is it possible? Do you think it's possible that our Pentagon could be working secretly, as secretly as Himmler's was? on weapons that nobody else has or that we've never seen before. Remember Luis Elizondo? He was the former director of ATIP. You know why he quit? And he said this in an interview. He quit because a Pentagon chief came up to him, got a military suit, he didn't say who he was, said, uh, Luis, I need you to stop investigating these UFOs. Okay, sir, tell me why. He said, because these things are demons, devils. He said, you have no idea what you're messing with. These things are demons. Now, I don't know who that was, but he's got that right. So while we've got some guys in the Pentagon saying, uh, we need to leave this alone, we've got other guys saying, Let's find out what we can do. In the speech that Luis Elizondo gave, he said ATIP focused their investigation on not just what they were, but how they worked. Lift, propulsion, control, power generation, spatial temporal translation, signature reduction. In other words, they can't be detected. Technology integration, materials, configuration and structure, human interface, armament, emphasis on unconventional technology capabilities 40 years in the future and beyond, no exploitation of current technology, investigate legitimacy of currently observed phenomena. Are they achievable by current understanding of physics and engineering? If not, what research is required to achieve? In other words, Let's figure out how we can make weapons for warfare. Either against the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Russians, or against the Fourth Kingdom. Which I believe now is exactly why 
Paul told us, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I understand that when you read the internet all day long, then you do want to go out and buy guns and buy a lot of ammo. I understand that, and I did. I become more convinced every day that I read the Bible that I'll probably never use them. Because I think what's coming down, not just to America, but to the entire world, is a different type of war against a kingdom that is not of this earth, who have weapons that are not of this earth. And if we're going to defeat them, the only way that we will defeat them is that if we have better weapons than they have, such as a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, the Son of Righteousness, and the Sword of the Spirit, which is sharper than any of their two-edged swords. I hope you have that kind of armament, because I believe, I believe it now more than ever. Now that I know what Himmler and Hitler were working on, I, this guy, whoever wrote that book, he gets it. He may not understand the biblical aspect of it. But the kingdom that they're trying to bring on, the new Babylon, it's just a mockery of the new Jerusalem. And that kingdom will be established temporarily. And that kingdom will be defeated by a stone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense but a living stone, precious to those of us who love it. I want you to love this Bible as much or more than I do. And the only way you'll do that is by asking God to put it in your heart and then read it. So that's the dark sun. I have no idea right now about the moon, but we'll work on that, all right? You're the reason why we do what we do. Thank you for your help, your aid, the blessings that you are to us, and for helping us help the people of Kenya and preach the gospel around the world. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.